Welcome to the Parents Guide. This is where you'll find out what's going on in schools and hear some of the key issues being discussed from the parents' point of view. If you have school-aged children, this program is for you. We'll be focusing on behaviour in primary schools with two parents, Denise Roberts and Gillian Murray. Hello. We're also joined by an advisor with many years' experience in primary education, Joe Mason. Hello. We've been looking at some programmes from Teachers TV and we'll be showing some extracts during our discussion. These programmes were made for teachers, but they also open up a window for parents to look into classrooms and see what's going on in schools today. The first programme we're going to look at is about a method called transactional analysis that aims to improve behaviour. In this extract, we see Nikki Rosewall, head teacher of Grange Middle School in Harrow, using the technique. Okay, we may not need all of it. No. Both of you have been really angry and you were fighting. So can you go and stand where you think you were when you were fighting? Both of you. Okay. Actually go and stand on it, Zuba, that's all right. When Zuba told you that you were rough, Zuba, where do you think you were? Which ego state were you in there when you were telling him? Which were you in? when you were telling him, right, excellent. What is that? Controlling the parent. Okay. So what you were doing is talking to Aaron and you were saying you're too rough, telling him what to do. He felt that you were in pain. He was in child. And what actually happened was, you what, sorry, Aaron? I was in free crowd at that moment and didn't have intent to birth. Right. When he actually hit you, what happened to you? Where did you go? Where did you go? OK, yeah, you were there as well. And you've ended up... What would have happened if grown-ups hadn't come along at that point? Adult. Do you think you would have got yourself into adult? Stayed. Yeah. You think you would have done, and Aaron, you think you would have stayed in child? OK. How would you have got yourself into adult? When he came, I could have just ignored him and just walked away. So where are you now, both of you, talking like this and doing this thinking? Where have you come? Adult. Right. Well, then where are you now? Yeah? OK. Denise, what did you think of that technique? Well, I thought that the, um, the approach was really, um, really very good, really, for... I liked the way the head teacher was um, speaking to the two boys and getting them to understand and think through their actions and, and to see how they could have behaved differently. Um, perhaps the only thing that I, I thought was um, that I might have a question mark over was, was asking them to act like adults. Because just as a child, as children, I wouldn't dream of asking my children to, to act like adults. I, I would probably use words like um, behave sensible or um, mature. Um, but I don't really believe that children are miniature adults, so I, I probably wouldn't use that. But the technique in, in general I thought was a good one. Well, one of the things that bothered me about it, but, I mean, Gillian, you may have a view, is how that would be reinforced at home, because it's quite a complicated process, and the parents would the parents be brought into what was being done in the school or not, and would they be expected to practice the same sort of thing out of school? I think the parents would need to know that the school obviously was, was using this method for their behaviour because especially if they're using, as Denise said, the adult, then it could be very easy for children to say, but you're in an adapted child mode, mother, or, or that they'd need to be aware. And it, I think it makes it quite difficult for parents because school is, is a certain set of hours. H at home, it's quite a different environment. And yes, obviously you expect your child to behave. It's probably a slightly different set of rules at home. Joe, do you think that for a behaviour management technique to work in school, it does need to be reinforced at home? I mean, if, if parents are practising diff totally different techni techniques of behaviour management, will the school be able to be successful? I think the parents need to understand what's happening in the school. I think Julian raised a, a point about, you know, if the children bring home this language of bossy parent and free child and adapted child, that's going to raise queries for parents that, that shouldn't be raised, that, that this should be explained, and parents should have been invited to come in and discuss and, and understand what's happening in school. 
But I think children do understand that school and home are separate environments and that one set of rules applies to school and, and they may be slightly different rules that apply to home. So I don't think necessarily we need to take the practices that we have in school per se back, back, back into the home environment, mm. but that there should be a mutual understanding of, of mm. what's going on. Well, well, what becomes clear really is that there are all sorts of different solutions that schools can possibly use and this is only one of them and it may be quite experimental. And in the next extract, we're going to visit Herbert Morrison Primary School in Lambeth, where the behaviour management policy reinforces the positive as well as the negative. Children get ticks on the happy side or on the sad side, and there is a system of rewards and sanctions. Right, young man. How are we going to resolve this? You didn't do much, as much work as you normally do. What are we going to do? Because you're behind now, aren't you? So what are you going to do? You've got to catch up before we do the next one next week. What are you going to do? Catch up with Sorry? Catch up with everyone. How? How are you going to do it? Can you ask the children outside to shut the door for you, Can you wait one minute? Let me just talk with that. You are supposed to be outside. Get them. Oh, what? That's not going to help me now. I need you to finish that work, don't I? And when are you going to do it? Now. You're going to do it right now? Go ahead and start, please. Children with sad tics miss an increasing amount of time off break. Four sad tics means a trip to the head. Right, young lady, you've had your five minutes. I hope I don't see your name on the sad side today. Okay, let's go. Sad that Reese is in here now because he's normally very quick, aren't you? And Reese got four stars on the good side yesterday, didn't you? And a special certificate, didn't you? So, Gillian, that was a very different approach and maybe more a traditional one based on rewards and sanctions. Do you think that's more effective? I do, and I think it's, it's easier for parents to relate to it, but also what I, what I like about that is when they're on the sad side and they need to stay behind, they were actually given responsibility for their actions, and although the decision, the outcome was obviously going to be to stay behind, they were given the opportunity to make that decision and given the responsibility. And I think if they're given responsibility for their actions, that also help, helps the child and, and feels gives them a, a sen more sen a sense of well-being, possibly, and the, just the positive praise is always, I think, very good. Do you think, uh, Denise, that, that focusing on good behaviour is the best way to, to tackle behaviour? Because, I, I mean, there may be some parents who favour a more traditional approach, and I think the head teacher in this film said so at another point, that every bit of bad manners ought to be tackled. And Do you think that children should be ticked off or...? More praise is the way to do it. Well, I do. I, I, I certainly do. I'm all for, all for praise um, to give the children that sense of encouragement, raise their self-esteem. And when I watched that clip, I looked at the, the little, little, little boy that, made, um, that was involved in making the decision as to whether he was going to do the work now or later, or, you know, and he tucked his head down. And I just got a sense that you know, he was really focusing on what he was doing because he felt very much part of the decision and, and you know, the choice that he was making, he was very much involved in, in, in that. And um, I think that that probably helped to make him feel good about what he, you know, about finishing his work. Jo, the, the, the role of the head teacher was quite important here, you know, being sent to the head either for the sort of praise, the ultimate praise or presumably the ultimate sanction as well. Do you think that these policies always work best when, you know, the head is strongly involved in, as a sort of figurehead of the, the behaviour policy? Absolutely. I, I think that that works well for children, teachers and, and parents alike, that, that the whole school are involved and that the head is seen to be, you know, at an, an end of, of the behaviour policy that is both good and, and bad. And the head also sending the certificates home or letters home, do you, is that something you've experienced as a parent, Denise? Um, and does it, yeah, I have. Do you have I a mean, thrill that... when you get the... Yeah. Postcard from the school. I, but I looked at that clip and saw that the um, little girl um, was sent to the head teacher because she had actually been good. Um, I thought that was fantastic, and certainly it brought back memories of my my own son um, being sent. Um, well, me being sent a letter home from school um, and opening it and thinking, my goodness, what's this? What's he done? Um, that's your normal reaction. But then open it and saying, please congratulate your son because. He's been mentioned in the, in the good logbook four times this week, and I think 
that that's you know that's a real turnaround and um, from children being sent to the head teacher only when they've been bad so yeah well that's a nice positive note to move on to our next extract in which we're going to see sue cowley a former teacher and author of getting the buggers to behave as she visits summerfield junior and infant school in birmingham this extract is about school rules and includes a dramatization of the children's own playground police <laughs> We will keep our hands, feet and other objects to ourselves. We will call everybody by their given names. We will do as we are asked the first time. We will walk around school without disturbing others. You know, it's really important that the rules are displayed everywhere. These rules work really well here because they're short, they're realistic and they're achievable. They're also phrased in a positive way. Unlike some schools, where there's a huge long list of rules, including the length of your skirt, the colour of your hair, and so on and on and on. A really good thing here is that the children feel they have ownership of their rules. At Summerfield, the children have their own playground police who can swoop once there's been any infringement of the school rules. Oopsie! I made a mistake. Every single game you cheat all the time. I just, I just said I made a mistake. I just said I just made a mistake. This row over a game of cards is resolved with a session of peer group mediation. The mediator's rules are speak one at a time without interrupting each other, speak with respect and don't blame each other. We have some mediator's promises as well. We will not take sides, we will not gossip, we will not tell you what to do. What's the problem? was playing cards and I accidentally picked up two cards instead of one. But when I realised I haven't, and we've been saying that I've cheated, I've cheated, and I said... It's all part of the school's philosophy of involving the children in the making and application of the rules. Julian, did you feel that was a school where the pupils really were making the rules or did you feel that the, they were being sort of manipulated by the teachers in a way to get the outcome that the staff wanted. I wonder if there was an element of guidance from the staff because they obviously it's an out planned school, they need to be walking around. But then in general in schools it's better to walk than to run and probably the case in most. But we didn't see an instance of them putting together the rules and I do wonder how much the children do have an input, although obviously on the surface they do, but how much of that the teachers would want, like to take out as their idea of what those rules would, they would like them to be, the school mm. rules. Denise, I mean, some traditionalists might think that was just one step too far down the road to pupil democracy. Do you think it is important for pupils to have a say in the rules of their school, or do you think it's better to have it imposed from above? Well, while I was watching it, I was thinking about the kind of things that make um, people feel part of a community or part of a family, and it really usually is involvement. Um, I think you get far better out of people when you involve them in processes. So I think that it was a good thing um, for the children to be involved in, in, in thinking up some rules. And even if they got um, received some of the guidance from the teachers, um, um, from the head teacher, from the teachers, um, I think that, you know, overall, uh, just the process of them being involved would have had a very positive effect on the, on the children themselves. What, what about what, managing all these different types of behaviour strategies in one school? Do you think that's possible? Do you think a school has to have just one set of rules or could you be doing transactional analysis and rewards and sanctions and short rules and... Uh, well, I think you can operate some of these systems together. Um, I think the ethos of, of many schools is, is the one that we saw in, in the second clip, which is about positive behaviour management. But whilst you're being positive in, in your management of the children, so you're looking for the good and, and trying to ignore the negative behaviours that you don't want to encourage, you could also be operating this system of transactional analysis, looking at ego states with some of the more mature pupils, where the children are therefore focusing on how they could have changed their behaviours. So the behaviour has already happened there. It's already been an unwanted behaviour. But here the children are now exploring ways that they might have 
resolve that situation at the time so that they, they can take that learning forward to think about you know, the next set of circumstances that they may be in and how they can put that, that learning into place. And alongside that, if you're going to have a, a policy of positive behaviour management, I think it's really important that the, the children are clear about the expectations. Denise and Gillian, I mean, we've seen children being involved in the setting of the rules. Do you think that parents ought to be involved? That, that was one thing that really struck out to me watching the clips was that there, you know, there wasn't really any sign of, of, um, of um, communication with parents or interaction with parents. Gillian, did you feel the same? No, I think that the school and the teachers, that's their environment. I think we should be aware, but I don't think we should necessarily be involved in the decision making for the, for the daily running of the school. I think there's, there's governing bodies that are represented by parents that make decisions that are that are probably bigger and more encompassing but I think on the daily running I don't think the parent I think it becomes far too complicated well that will obviously be an ongoing issue the involvement of parents in, in a lot of these matters but in the next program we're going to look at two newly qualified teachers who are doing their first jobs in some very challenging circumstances this extract shows them as they try to work through their problems what's going on with your behavior this week Oh, that's pretty quiet, didn't you? <laughs> A little bit of slippage there. Yeah. How would you feel if I moved David next to Devante and you beside David on the other side? How'd that work for you? Would that not be good? But the, the thing is, the reason why I'm thinking that is because you and Devante talk quite a bit. So I'm trying to cut that out. And I know that you don't talk to David. So if I put you over there, does that stop the talking a little bit? And that gives you more points? Yeah. In the morning, I kind of manage to keep fairly calm and, you know, straightforward. But I think by the afternoon, I'm feeling so frazzled. It's really easy for me to just lose my temper with them, and which is kind of really not what you want to do. At Be school. positive. Always focus on the children who are doing the right thing. Yeah. And that way, you'll get the class on side. You need to bring the class on side with you. The children who always behave. And what I need from Mrs. Ishmael is a target that we can set for home as well, because. I think Ishmael kind of has the attitude that if he loses his points here, so what, he's got treats at home. I actually had one child say to me, stop it because Miss is getting stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Never let them see it. You should always be smiling and I saying know. how wonderful some children yeah. are yeah. and not getting cross. Mm -hmm. Difficult to do. Very. But mm -hmm. so much better when you do. Yeah. For everybody. You'll be my pencil man as long as you give me a three. Okay? Okay. okay well, thank thank you. you. Nice to see you again. Okay, see you tomorrow morning, Ishmael. Okay, see you soon. Denise, what did you think of the teachers in that clip? Well, many things went through my mind um, while, when I watched that. Um, first of all, I felt um, that they, I felt very sorry for, for the teacher that was struggling. I really, my heart went out to, to her. Um, but I thought that there was a, a big difference between the way how she approached um, her job as a teacher and the way how the other teacher approached the job as a teacher, the attitudes were totally different. So initially sympathetic, but do you think if your child was in that class and after three months she was still unable to control them, you'd feel quite as sympathetic for her plight? Well, if after three months she was still struggling to control, I'd, I'd probably be looking at the, the, um, the support, support system that the school was putting in place rather than than her own skills. Jo, do you think, what, 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 what would a parent have a right to expect then as support in the first few weeks for a newly qualified teacher? I think when you first start in your first few weeks of teaching it's very easy to take a big step back so that you don't quite enter the profession at, at the level at which you were when you, you came out of your training um, and I think perhaps what, what those trainees to a certain extent there have are trying to juggle all the balls now in, in one go without the support of the university or the skit or the, the provider that, that put them into the profession and I think sometimes it's easy to lose sight of one of the balls while you're trying to juggle and one of the things that those trainees in those clips were sometimes not as proactive about was the positive behaviour management that we were talking early on. So it's not unknown for trainees when they first go in to drop one of the balls that, that they picked up when, when they were in their training process. You know, a new teacher with a new class 
always has issues to resolve about behaviour management. Even if the children had a very good structure of behaviour management with their previous class teacher, just a new personality and a new way of, of working can mean that every teacher at, at the beginning of a, a school year has to first of all settle their children down and set their boundaries and get their behaviour management policy working for their classroom and, and the new environment. Do you, do you think, would you like to see, Gillian, newly qualified teachers having more training in communicating with parents over issues like behaviour? I have a lot of experience with the school that I'm involved in, my son's school, and all the new teachers there have always been very proactive and very good. So there obviously is training. I can't believe that that just comes from their personality. Do you think that's an issue, Denise? Well, when I looked at the clip of the uh, teacher speaking to the parent there, um, when she got to the point where she said, um, taking away sanctions at home, I kind of cringed. Um, and I thought that, you know, her approach to that, even that was, even if it was her objective, I thought that her approach to that could have been a bit, you know, probably different, really, more working with the parent to say, what could we do if, um, you know, if your son or your daughter is, is not doing what they ought to be doing in school, you know, how can you be involved in, in supporting them so that they come into school with the right attitude? So, so you're not opposed to the idea of the teacher trying to get home and school to work together, but you just, you're more concerned about the way she was able to communicate that with the parent, and how would you think an effective way would be? Maybe to ask the mother first? What? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I think that it would be more in the line of a discussion that, rather than saying, mm -hmm. you know, you need to do this, because then obviously you're stepping over, um, in, over you know, you're stepping into someone else's space. Um, so really for the teacher and the parent to talk through what the options might be and to come up with those solutions together. Well, I'm sure the issue of how far schools can go in terms of infringing parent space is one we'll hear more about. But our final clip is from a programme about anger management, a critical skill for all staff. Often it falls to teaching assistants to sort out the problem in the heat of the moment. In the programme we see Jackie and Valerie, teaching assistants at Kingswood School in South London exploring techniques to help pupils manage their anger. They're supported by the learning mentor, Sarah Harris, and in this extract we see Sarah introducing the ideas of dirty and clean anger. So examples of dirty anger, they might kick the chairs, or they might punch another child, or they might shout at an adult. And that breaks the rules because they are hurting property and they're hurting other people. If we had to come up with some ways that we could be angry but we were following the anger rules, what kind of things could we do? Don't fight back. Okay, what could we do instead of fighting back? Um, go to the teacher. Okay. Clean anger might be going for a big run around the playground at lunchtime or talking to their friend about it or ten deep breaths. So they're things that allow the child to calm down and they also stick to the anger rules as well. Sometimes it's hard to talk about our feelings, but when we write it down, sometimes we can make a little bit of sense of it, can't we? Yeah, the last one could be counting to ten. Oh, counting to ten, fantastic. This session lends itself well to role play, to get children to think about managing their own anger. Hey, stupid. Hey, fat pig. Hey, fat kid, get out of my face. Get out of my face. OK, thank you. Now I'm going to choose two children to show us what they could have done. Right, Nathaniel and Janelle. What are you doing? Do I know you? Yes, you do know me. Why was you fighting me last night? I didn't fight you. Well, I want to fight. Well, I don't want to fight. Yeah, well, I do. Well, I don't. Excellent. That's well fantastic. done. Denise, what did you learn from that programme? Well, the terms dirty and clean anger are terms that I've never heard before, so that, that was something new to me. Um, but I think that most of all what stood out for me was the fact that um, the, the, you know, there was this teaching the, the children that anger was okay. Um, it's okay to be anger, but it's just how you express that anger that's the issue. And I think that that was a really, really interesting point. Do you think that explaining that simply to children about understanding the reaction that there sometimes happens within their bodies when they get angry is something that's, that's worth schools doing, exploring those ideas? 
I do. I mean, these seem to be fairly new ideas that are, probably aren't developed in a lot of schools, but it certainly seems to be a very good idea, I think, a very positive way of approaching children who obviously have quite, I say, um, severe anger problems, have, have quite a problem managing their anger. Do you think there is such a thing as clean anger and dirty anger? Do you think that's a helpful distinction? I, I think the distinction there was helpful. I'm not... I'm not too sure about the terminology that's used. What I got from that was that the learning mentor was trying to help the children see that there were reactions that they made when they were angry that were inappropriate, sort of um, violence or aggression or shouting or rudeness. And then there are ways, clean anger, which were about how they could avoid those situations and how they could control that anger by counting to ten, by going to talk to a teacher, by walking away from a, a situation. So I'm not sure that the term anger describes what actually she was doing with those children but the process that, 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 that they were going through I thought was really valid. One of the things that's very obvious though is that it's quite labour and resource intensive working with children who do have these issues because you've got a, a full-time learning mentor dealing maybe with one or two children. Do you think that's a useful way of using the school's resources? I think this is where the, the, the teaching assistants that we saw at the end of that clip can be very, very useful. And, and I know that from watching more of that clip, there has been quite a lot of input from the learning mentor with the teaching assistants. So she's explained her processes and, and her dirty and clean anger and how she works with children. And then the teaching assistants are taking the children and working with groups of children exploring anger, while the learning mentor is probably back in the classroom teaching the, the children numeracy or literacy or whatever else is going on that day. Denise, do you, do you think we listen to children enough in schools? No, I don't. I, I, I think that, I mean, this, I mean, this is one of the things that I, um, this is one of the reasons why I felt quite encouraged by having a look at these clips and, and seeing some of the involvement of the teachers in this clip. Um, and I think there was one point where a teacher was saying that sometimes we don't listen to um, children, we just wade into the situation and assume um, that we know what's going on and then we make a judgment based on that assumption and um, and then only afterwards perhaps do you realise that you know there's a bit more to the story. So no, I don't think that children are listened to enough and I think that that really does have an adverse effect on the children because um, you know we say that if a child is if a child is hungry they can't, they can't learn. And if a child is unhappy or they feel that they, their point of view has been undermined or they've been ignored, I think that that would have this, a similar effect on their self-esteem and that they might find it difficult to, to, um, to go along with, with what they ought to, what, with what the school expects of them. Well, I think most parents would agree with that comment, but we have to end it there. You can have your say, though, by emailing parents at teachers.tv and you can find all the information about programmes you have seen and more on our website at Teachers TV. Details at the end of the programme. Thanks to my guests on this programme, Denise, Gillian and Joe. Goodbye. Goodbye. And for myself, Fiona Miller, thanks for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.